haven't got the, uh, the clicker with me. There's, there's one or two things. We, we lost the hymn books, or some of the hymn books, until just before the service began, with all the change about that we had um, for the wedding last week and changing it back to, to the, facing the normal way. One or two things have gone missing. Another thing that's gone missing, if I can just make an appeal for it, there is a spare set of keys for the church downstairs in the, that's normally kept in the little drawer down in the kitchen. It's not front door keys or back door keys, so the, the, the security of the building is not compromised, but it's some of the internal door keys. So if anybody's had them or knows where they are, if they could be returned to the little drawer in the kitchen, that would be most helpful. Thank you very much. Now, we're in James, as you know, <clears throat> working through this book of very practical help. And last time, we looked at the very small member of the body, didn't we? The tongue. And the importance, um, the, 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 the main thrust of what we were looking at last time was the importance of keeping the, the, the tongue under control. Because so easily, we can say something, can't we? Just a, a rash comment or a rash response. And, and in, in, in fact, the, the examples that, that James, when he's writing this letter, the examples that he gives, he says, look at, the, look at the large ships, yet they have such a small rudder, and it controls which direction they go in. And he gives another example of a fire, and a forest fire, yet it starts with such a small thing, a spark even can start a forest fire. And so James says, we need to keep our tongues under control because if we don't, it can cause so much damage. And if we keep it under control, if our tongues are under the control of the Holy Spirit, then what good can be brought about? It can be used for blessing God's people. Today, we're going to look again at the issue of wisdom. This is the second time we're, we're looking at this um, because it comes up in chapter 1. So let's read, first of all, our section um, in chapter 3. It's on page 1217 if you're using a church Bible. And we're going to be looking at um, verses 13 through to 18. And hopefully it should come up on the screen in just a moment. But I'll start reading anyway. You can catch up on the screen when it comes up. James chapter 3, verse 13 says this. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is God's word. Let's just pray before we continue. Father, we know that we are blessed as just as even reading your word. And as we've read these few verses today, and as we consider them and help to understand and learn their application to us today, we pray, Holy Spirit of God, would you help us? Would you open up these verses to our understanding, we pray? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you can scroll on the next two clicks, please, Toby. As I've said already, we've looked at this issue of wisdom from above already. Um, firstly, in chapter 1 where the word of God told us in verse 5, I think it is, yes, verse 5, if any lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives freely. I think it's on the next screen, Toby. But we have this issue raised again in this chapter. And what we have to remember as we look at this chapter, it flows out of the previous section. It flows out of what I've just explained right at the beginning about the, the tongue and having the tongue under control. So James asks the question, flowing out from that section about the tongue and keeping it under control, he asks the question, who's wise among you? Who's understanding? And so think of it in connection with that passage primarily. But then we're going to look at it in terms of it's set aside as its, as its own subject, if you like, the importance 
of wisdom from above and where it comes from. So in relation to the taming of our tongues, James says, who is wise and understanding? And the response to that, to the response to that question, James ties it in with this principle that we've already looked at of faith and works, that the two go together. In other words, what he's saying is, is if you're truly born again, if you, if you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that your heart has been made clean before God, then what will be seen, what is worked out of that, of that experience, is wise actions, is understanding according to God. And we'll look at that as we, as we, uh, as we go on. But because it says in this, in this section... In this first verse, by his good conduct, the fruit of wisdom will be seen. That's effectively what it's saying, isn't it? In verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So in the things that we do, the things that we say, the way that we behave, the way that we conduct our lives as Christians, will demonstrate wisdom and understanding to those around us. <clears throat> if we are wise and understanding, the very nature of that proposition is that we will not act foolishly, isn't it? Sadly, some of us, I, I have to hold my hand up, some of us do act foolishly from time to time. But, but James is presenting here, the word of God presents to us here, if you're wise and understanding, you won't act foolishly and you won't act out of jealousy or selfish ambition. Because James says if that's what you've got in your heart, i.e. jealousy and selfish ambition, if you've got that in your heart, the fruit or the working out of that is boasting and lies. That's what he's opening up in these, in these verses here. In fact, he, he goes on to say more than that. He says, where jealousy and selfish ambition are operating, where you see those operating, where they exist, there will be disorder or confusion and every vile practice. And God gives a very good reason for this. He says, because these fruits of disorder and every vile practice, these fruits do not come from the wisdom which comes from above, which comes from God. It comes as a direct result of earthly wisdom. You only have to look around, don't you, to the world that we live in and the circumstances that we face day by day. The wisdom of the world that the world gives us is to hold on to my rights, that my rights are paramount. Take what you're entitled to. Revenge? Yes, go for it. Go for revenge. You have revenge. You earned it. You, you deserve it. It's the principle, isn't it, of putting yourself at the front of the queue for everything in life rather than allowing others to go before you. <clears throat> and that's the, that's the wisdom that the world teaches us, that society teaches us around us. I was reminded of a verse from the Proverbs only this week. <clears throat> it says this. Wait for it says this, the leech has two daughters, give and give, they cry. Three things are never satisfied, four never say enough. That is the principle and the attitude of the world that we live in, isn't it? That everywhere in the world that we live in, it's, it's give, it's take, it's, it's, what I can, it's what I can get out of a situation. And it comes from this earthly wisdom, not from the wisdom that comes from above, that comes from God. Now, God's quite clear in this scripture. He's not just saying, when he says this, he's not just saying, it's not nice to be like that. That's not what this passage is saying. God is saying to us that he says, actually, it's unspiritual and demonic. It comes from the enemy of our souls. It comes from Satan. That character, of that way of behaving, ultimately comes from God's enemy, our enemy, Satan. And that's sobering, isn't it? For every one of us, myself included. 
That if we demonstrate this type of behavior, it comes from a wisdom that is not heavenly, that has not come from God, but it comes from a wisdom that is unspiritual and ultimately is demonic. <clears throat> Tim, you say, isn't that a bit harsh to say that? Well, it might sound harsh, but it's actually what God's word says. And we have to take it. You know, I was talking to David, I think it was, before the... Um, before the service, and, and this principle that, that, that I try to abide by by working systematically through books of the Bible, through chunks of Scripture, means that we have, to, we have to preach on the difficult verses as well as the nice verses that we'd enjoy and we like to preach about. And it's not very nice to say these things, that that, that, that wisdom, if it doesn't come from above, then ultimately it's from Satan. But it's the truth. It's what God's word says, and we've got to hold on to that. We've got to remember that as we work through our lives. <clears throat> so how do we apply this to ourselves? <clears throat> when faced with this situation, and when faced with this, this predicament of wisdom, and wisdom from God, and and the lack of it as, as is presented in chapter 1. I recognize my own need and my own lack in this area. And maybe others recognize that as well. But what do we learn from this? Chapter 1 gave us the answer, didn't it? If anyone lacks wisdom, ask God. And it wasn't just that chapter 1 said, ask God. But it says, ask God who gives generously. The implication from that is if you need wisdom and you haven't got it, ask God and he will give you wisdom. It wasn't just speaking of a general principle that God is generous. We know that anyway. That's covered throughout the whole of scripture. But in this specific area of needing wisdom, you ask God, he will give it to you. <clears throat> we have that assurance that James gives us in saying that. I want to share, I was just looking just before um, we came up because uh, it, this came to me as we were sitting there. I was reminded this week of a, of a song which means a lot to me because of a time when I heard it. We were going through a very difficult circumstance and situation with important decisions to be made and not knowing which way to turn. <clears throat> I remember um, at that time for some reason, it was my turn to cook the dinner that night. It only rarely happens. Jackie does most of that, but um, certainly in the week, I, I rarely cook during the week. And, but for whatever reason, it was my turn to cook. And I came through from the lounge into the kitchen. Everybody was in the lounge just waiting for dinner and so on and, and what have you. And I came into the, the kitchen and a song was playing. We had a, a CD at the time from the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. And a song was, uh, was playing, and it just spoke perfectly into the situation that we were dealing with, to the point that as I stood there, the tears were just pouring down my face, watering the, the fish fingers and whatever it was we had for dinner that night. But the tears were just, they were just flowing because God spoke to me through that song. And it says this, decisions must be made, and now I have a choice. I need your wisdom, Lord. I need to hear your voice. I'm facing challenges and the walls are closing in. I'm crying out to you, my one true faithful friend. Hear my prayer, O Lord. I need you in my life. I cry to you, O Lord. Please lead me to the light. Show me the way, O Lord, and cleanse me from my sin. I need you. I need you once again. That situation, and I'm not going to go into the detail of the situation at all, but we needed wisdom. We needed to know what to do in that specific circumstance. <clears throat> and here we were tying up this thing and trying to work out this thing and trying to analyze something else and so on and so forth, going through the, the situation over and over and over again in my mind. That's what I tend to do. You've, some of you know that because of you, your conversations with me. But that, the words of that song as I walked into the kitchen that night just spoke perfectly into the situation. We need Jesus. And if we're lacking wisdom, we need the wisdom of God. And we need to cry out to him and he will give it. He will show us the way. He will show us what to do. That's how we apply this scripture here. 
or these scriptures that we're looking at, we're considering chapter 1 and chapter 3, this matter of wisdom. If we cry out to God, he will answer. I'm testament to that. And so many of you here are testament to that. When you face difficult situations, you've lacked wisdom, you cry to God, and he comes in. Maybe it's through a song, as he did for me that day. Maybe it's through reading his word. Maybe it's by someone coming to, alongside you and sharing with you. And speaking into the situation when they knew nothing about it. But yet bringing a word of God into your situation that speaks directly to your circumstances. And that's how we have to try and understand these things. But I want to, we, we, we've looked in, already in the first quarter of an hour or whatever it is I've been talking, we've looked at the, the negative aspect of, 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 um, of this section. <clears throat> James is speaking about wisdom from above, but he speaks in these first three or four verses, he's actually speaking about the negative aspect. If we don't operate by wisdom that comes from above, if not, where does it come from? Well, it's come from beneath. It's come from the enemy of God. So I want to focus on these last two verses in the, in the time that's remaining to us, verses 17 and 18, and present to you the positive aspect of wisdom, but in particular, wisdom from above that James covers in these, uh, these two verses. Now, there are seven characteristics. <clears throat> I'm going to go through them one by one, and Toby, they'll come, they should come up on the, uh, on the screen one by one. There we go. So the first one is that it is pure. Verse 17, the wisdom from above is first pure. In other words, it's clean, it's innocent, it's perfect. God's wisdom is perfect. There's no, there's no shadow or shading with God's wisdom. It is perfect. And perfect not just generally, but perfect for your situation, perfect for my situation. Perfect for exactly what you're going through today or this week. This word that is used um, for purity here, that, that, that the wisdom from above is pure, it comes from the same root as holiness. And so as we recognize that God is holy... There is purity about God. And so the wisdom that comes from God is holy, it is pure. <clears throat> and it almost goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. As it comes from God, it's without double motive. You know, sometimes when, um, when, when we get these phone calls, <clears throat> there are incredibly wise people, aren't there, that tell us how much we can claim for for PPI that we maybe had or didn't have. And you tell them, no, sorry, I'm not interested. That's the polite version. If I'm having my tea, they get, uh, they get a more gruff tone. But you tell them, no, I'm not interested. And they say, but this is good for you. This is going to help you. It's going to benefit you. It's going to get you some money back. And they're trying to give you this wisdom. But why are they doing it? They're doing it because they're going to make a fast buck out of you. Yes, they might make a claim, and they might, make, they might claim 1,500 pounds or 15,000 pounds, whatever it may be, but they'll take some of it. There's a double motive there. But the wisdom that comes from God is pure. No double motive at all. Absolutely perfect and pure and right for your situation and for mine. Second one, Toby, is peaceable. We're in verse 17 here. <clears throat> Interesting word, this, isn't it, that God's... Wisdom from above is peaceable. Not just peaceful, but it's peaceable. And that gives the sense that, it, that it, um, it works towards peace. That's what God's wisdom does. And so as we exercise that wisdom, as, we, as that fruit is seen in our lives, it works towards peace. Towards peace among one another. Towards peace in, in our fellowship, in our church here. Towards peace in our community even. So note that. It's not just that God's wisdom is peaceful. But it is peaceable. I think James is talking about this. I think if you go back to Acts and look, I think it's chapter 15 and chapter 21. The reference is there. You see something of James the peacemaker, don't you? That council of, uh, the council of Jerusalem, he, he brought the disciples together and they came to a common consensus of the right way of going forward. 
The third item here, gentleness. Now, we learn gentleness, of course, up on the screen, Toby, thank you. Um, gentleness, we learn it perfectly from Jesus himself. Remember what Paul said in the, in the second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 10? He refers to him, uh, it, or refers to the, the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Yes, I know that Christ is holy. I know that he is all-powerful. I know we have that wonderful vision of him at the beginning of Revelation. In all his power and authority. But also, Jesus is meekness and gentleness. And we see both of those things working together. And it's to be seen in the working out of this wisdom. Wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle. Fourth item is that it's open to reason. In other words, if I'm exercising the wisdom of God, I'm prepared to give way. You know, far too often I dig the trench. You know, we've been remembering the Battle of the Somme, haven't we, in the last couple of weeks, and we, we have all those visions again, those, those pictures of the trenches that they built throughout northern France and so on. And too often we, we dig our own trench, don't, don't we? And we, we get entrenched in our position, and this is the position I'm going to hold, and I'm going to stand there. And if we're trying to be pious, we say, and I'm standing for the truth. But yet, one of the fruits, one of the working out of the wisdom of God is that we're open to reason. We're willing to give way. It conveys a soft heart, doesn't it? I'm not suggesting that we become pushovers. I'm not saying that at all. But the position of digging in with my opinion, that evidence is pride, doesn't it? But there's to be a willingness to be open to, to reason. The fifth characteristic, full of mercy and uh, good fruits. One of the things I read during the week <clears throat> in relation to this was that mercy in the New Testament is only ever spoken of about the person of God or about godly people, people who are following God. Now, you're going to have to bear with me because I want to research that. I, I read this comment, and I don't like just taking comments per se, so I shall be researching it over the next few weeks to, to see that that's true and to see how that's worked out. But what the comment said was that in the New Testament, the only reference, the, the references to mercy is always in relation to God himself or to those who are following him, those who are godly people. What we have here presented is mercy and good fruits. They're presented as hand in hand. They're presented as a couplet. Not two individual items on the list, but as going together, mercy and good fruits. And so we're to see those worked out in our life as we experience God's wisdom, as we ask for God's wisdom and experience, receive it and experience it. What's to be seen? One of the things, the characteristics to be seen are mercy and good fruits in the way that we deal with others and speak to others. Sixth item up on the list is impartial. No favoritism. Whatever the difference practically or physically or socially or whatever it may be, whatever the difference we have between each other, we treat one another the same. And we face a situation, we treat this person exactly the same as we would treat anybody else. We looked at that, didn't we? I think it was about three or four weeks ago, maybe a month ago in chapter two. That issue of, of partiality and not having favorites, whatever the situation. And the last item in this, this list of characteristics is sincerity. That we're sincere. Or without hypocrisy. Without pretense. I think it goes back, doesn't it, to the first item on the list. It goes back to purity. Not having those double motives. And these seven characteristics are to be seen, if you like, as the working out of the wisdom of God. The wisdom from above in your life, in my life. Toby, if you want to go to the next screen, there's a couple of clicks there, I think. The final verse gives us the ultimate result of this. Verse 18 says, a harvest of righteousness 
is sown in peace by those who make peace. A whole harvest of, if I can call it this, and I'm trying to help us to understand what this means of righteousness, a whole harvest of right dealings with God, of right living before God. That's what's involved in righteousness. We're not talking here about self-righteousness, righteousness in my own eyes. That gets us nowhere. But we're talking about righteousness and what is right before a holy, righteous God. Now, in your printed notes, <clears throat> in your bulletin, there are three things for you to, to look at in relation to this. This issue of wisdom that comes from above. I've put down its source, its characteristics, and its result. Now, having gone through these six verses, you can trace these three things, the source, characteristics, and result, you can trace that in both types of wisdom. And that's what James has done in these six verses that we've been considering today. Wisdom that is not from above, not from God, its source is demonic. The scripture said that. Its characteristics are jealousy and self-ambition. Again, that was presented in God's word for us today. And its result, what is seen as a result of the wisdom from below, is disorder and every vile practice. As I've said, we can see that around us, can't we, in the world that we live in. But I want us to focus as we close on the positive aspects of this section found in verse 13, but also in verses 17 and 18. I'm not saying that Ignore the verses in between because they're not important. They are important as a warning to us. But let's focus our hearts and minds on what James says in a positive way about the wisdom from above. Looking at these three things again, its source, its characteristics, and its result. The source, of course, is from God. Wisdom from above. You have to go back to, to chapter 1, don't you, to confirm that. James is speaking in this section about wisdom from above. But go back to chapter 1. If you're lacking it, who do you ask? You ask God, he gives. So that's the source of this wisdom, from God himself. Not delegated in one sense. It's not the wisdom of Tim Bodman that God allows you to use. That won't get you very far. Or Bob McFarland, or whoever it is you might turn to. But it's the wisdom of God now, he may use one another in the fellowship, in the churches, one another that you know, and his own word to give you that wisdom, specifically what that might be for you. But recognize it comes from God. <clears throat> it's characteristics. Well, we've looked at those seven features listed for us in verse 17. It's first pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And then lastly, the result is this right living before God. And that's seen by those around you. Both here in the fellowship, also in your family setting, but also as, as you have to do with the wider world, the communities that God has called us to live in and be part of. They begin to see a wisdom that maybe is countercultural, that goes against what society says. It's a wisdom that comes from above that comes from God himself. I'm going to leave you, <clears throat> I've almost finished, I'm going to leave you with, with this. In these two sections that we've considered, I know we've read chapter 3, but we've been dipping in and out of chapter 1 as well, because the, the subjects are both related. But in these two sections on wisdom from above, James poses two questions. And bless him, he does give us the answers as well. He doesn't leave us to work it out. But the Spirit of God has given us the answer. The first question, Toby, these should come up on the, on the PowerPoint if you don't mind. The first is this, how and where do we get this wisdom? We've said it already, haven't we? Chapter 1. How do we get this wisdom? We ask. We ask God. And he gives generously. 
As I said already, that's a principle. It is a principle of God. The fact that we're here, the fact that we're saved is evidence that God gives generously. But even in this specific issue of needing wisdom in your circumstances, God will give generously to you. The second question is this. Who among you, who among us, is wise and understanding? And the section is in, the, 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 the response, the reply is in this section that we've been looking at today. The one who possesses godly wisdom is the one who demonstrates good conduct and works in his life. And that conduct bears out some of these seven characteristics that we've looked at. Purity, peaceable, gentle, open to reason and so on. And what do we see in all of these characteristics? As, as I've been studying through this and preparing for today, there's, there's a similarity in the language and the tenor of, of what is said. There's a similarity between the, the gifts of the Spirit, isn't there? But what do we see in relation to this overall list? It's, it's there for us at the end of verse 13. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. It's not that we do these things in our own strength and we have this tick list. You've heard me say this so many times, but it's a passion of mine that we don't want tick box Christianity. That here Tim's given us or the scripture's given us today a list of seven things. We need to tick them off and make sure we do them every day. No, if we need wisdom, we ask God and we receive from God and the working out what is seen in that and what is seen in that wisdom working in our lives are these seven characteristics that we've looked at today. But through it, there needs to be humility. That, of course, is the introduction to next week's sermon. Don't worry, I'm not going to start preaching that now. You'll have to, you'll have to wait till next week. We'll look, God willing, at the importance in the first half of, of chapter 4, the importance of humility before God. But I, I share that now because it's, it's key in relation to this wisdom. We need to work it out with humility. Recognizing that I am nothing. Recognizing that I can do nothing of myself. But if I need that wisdom for whatever situation I may face, whether it's an important decision about how to, how to lead my family in the ways of God, or whether it's a simple matter of, practical, of, of a practical nature in my life and walk as a Christian. Whatever it is, I can ask God, and he will give that wisdom. And the working out of that in humility will demonstrate something of the love of God to the community around us, will demonstrate something of right living before God so that all those around us see it. Let us pray. <clears throat> <coughs> Father, we, we come to you at the end of this time together to submit to you we, we acknowledge, oh God, our failings. We acknowledge our weaknesses. We acknowledge that so often we're not wise. We don't have understanding in the way that we deal with individuals, with people, with situations. But we thank you, oh God. As we've been reminded today, we have that resource in yourself. We can ask and you, who are a generous God, gives freely to us. May we work these things out in humility so that righteousness is seen as a fruit. So that the beautiful characteristics of your wisdom, O oh God, of purity, sincerity, and all these things that have been listed May they be seen in each one of our lives. May we put these things into practice. So we pray, would you help us, O oh God, as we commit ourselves into your care. In Jesus' name. <clears throat>